Well, there's no good feeling that comes on something like this saying, I told you so. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. You know, I just think back of, could I have been more, been more persuasive? But we've actually invested very little in a system to stop an epidemic. We're not ready for the next epidemic. Well, there's a number of respiratory viruses, and from time to time, one will come along that's very transmissive and causes some level of fatalities. Respiratory diseases are very scary uh, because you're still walking around on a plane, a bus, uh, when you're infectious. Unlike some other diseases like Ebola, where you're mostly in a hospital bed by the time the viral load uh, infects other people. There's some risks like earthquakes, where we see small earthquakes all the time, or you know the history of war or fire or hurricanes. So you don't forget, these pandemics only come along so irregularly that being lulled into a sense of security where it probably won't be a problem in the next few years, why should we put money into that? Uh, you don't buy the insurance policy, basically. This one will uh, help us understand it needs to be a priority. I point out two. One is climate change. Every year that would be a death toll even greater uh, than we've had in this pandemic. Also related to pandemics is something people don't like to talk about much, which is bioterrorism, that somebody who wants to cause damage could engineer uh, a virus. And so that means the cost, the chance of running into this is more than just the naturally caused epidemics like uh, the current one. Well, my favorite writer, Václav Schmiel, you know, wrote about all the potential kinds of disasters, like, you know, the risk of an asteroid, the risk of a, you know, Yellowstone-like eruption. And in fact, he showed that pandemics were significantly the biggest thing other than a human-caused nuclear war uh, that we needed to be more prepared. Well, certainly there will be more pandemics. The in ways that humans interact with other species, these viruses are coming across a species barrier, whether it's from bats or uh, monkeys, or it could increase our preparedness so we never have a death toll uh, anywhere near what we have today. You know, pandemics can be worse in terms of the fatality. Smallpox was a uh, over 30% fatality. You know, so a little bit we were lucky that the fatality here is not not super high, but. We can nip it in the bud. It'll still get to a lot of countries, but the number of deaths you know, uh, with the right system should be a tenth of what we, we've seen here. I would divide it into two sections. There's the field-based activity and the R&D activity. In R&D, uh, we need to mature mRNA so we can make it even faster and have factories all over the world, have it be cheap and thermostable. There's a lot that can go into therapeutics, including antibodies. On diagnostics, having the ability to give 10 million PCR tests a day. Then in terms of the field, we need a lot of diagnostic machines all over the world. We need a team of epidemiologists. So the investments are about equal between R&D uh, and the, the field-based group uh, and information that should be constantly flowing. Well, the internet has done something fantastic, which is if you want to learn you know, the people who watch you are, you know, getting an opportunity to understand science and what's going on. And that just wasn't there. Uh, and so for a lot of people, they're so much more informed. I mean, I have friends who ask me about these variants where I'm just stunned at how up to date they are with the latest information. So for people who want to learn facts, this is a golden age. You know, we focus on the negative part with some of these conspiracy theories and anti-factual things. And so because social media is so new, figuring out how you curb that, you know, labeling it, restrict the speed of spread of things that are titillating but false, uh, we are missing some good ideas to, uh, you know, not have this kind of uh, scary uh, phenomena that in the case of anti-vaccine things may slow down how quickly we get lots of people uh, to take the vaccine and therefore extend the epidemic and, and cost us in, in tens of thousands of lives. There are things like, you know, saying completely false things about, you know, vaccines. But there is kind of a gray area in the middle that figuring out what the rules are and who should be the one looking and interpreting those rules, wow, we are missing that today. You know, can you get a group of experts 
that are weighing in on these things. You don't really want the profit motive involved, uh, but you want uh, you know expertise and capacity. And so you know, a few years from now, I hope we're more sophisticated on uh, what how that line should be drawn. Making a safe vaccine uh, is more complicated than, say, making a jet engine. Uh, and people are very picky about vaccines. In fact, you could ruin the reputation of vaccines if you're making them in factories where the quality control at every stage is not exquisite. And you know, any mistake, you, know, you can have that factory shut down literally for months at a time when its output is needed to save millions of lives. So vaccine factories are not something that you just, you know, uh, you know, like open source code that you can take and, you know, mess around with. And so the, the limitations on how many vaccines are being made, that's based on how many great, capable vaccine manufacturers there are in the world. And we've made sure that the AstraZeneca has been made in these big Indian factories, and there's no royalty for that, no charge at all. Now, we've had to fund that, the Gates Foundation, these are companies we've been working on their factory quality for over a decade uh, so that there was spare capacity to make inexpensive vaccines. So Oxford University is, is wonderful, but they're not capable of doing a phase three trial and they, they don't have factories. We did tell Oxford that they needed to seek somebody with expertise uh, and AstraZeneca came in and we didn't. Uh, control that agreement, but they came in and said, hey, they want to do it on a nonprofit basis. And I'm impressed with how they put their best people on it and helped out. You know, the pharma companies didn't, who didn't get involved, nobody's criticizing them. So, you know, you feel sorry for the ones that are really uh, miraculously uh, helping make these vaccines. I'm not in a position to complain much. You know, I, I have a lot of things that uh, you know, make me extremely lucky. And, you know, I hope these conspiracy theories go away. You know, I don't know what it'll, what it'll mean for the future. Well, we, you know, we need the supply, we need the logistics, and we need the demand. And there are huge challenges in each of those. Um, I'm hopeful that Johnson & Johnson in the next month will get approved because that's a single dose vaccine, very cheap, highly scalable. So AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, and a few months later, Novavax, most of the developing world, those are the vaccines that will be going to them. And so we put billions into trying to make that happen. And you know, in a few months, hopefully it'll come together.